Okay, excellent. So, for the second presentation of this afternoon, we have a talk about great information theory. Okay, uh, so welcome everyone. I'm Dave Bowman, and I will be going over what I looked at during my um, project this year. Um, so, for an overview, we're first going to discuss, um, you know, why one might be interested in what a deformation is. We will then go over their definition and look over some examples, do some computations, and these computations will give us an idea about why they they might be a bit difficult to work with. And finally, we will then discuss a novel method that will allow us to produce quote unquote nice examples of these sorts of objects. Um, so first to justify why one might be interested, um, suppose that you're a physicist and there is some physical phenomenon that you're interested in. Um, you would like to study this, but before we can study it, we will need to be able to describe it mathematically. So we will develop a, a model of this phenomenon and this model will be parameterized by certain properties of the phenomenon that you've observed. Now, for us to be convinced that this model is reasonable, we would want it to be stable under small perturbations of these parameters that we've, we've gathered. And this notion of these small perturbations of parameters, this is what we're trying to focus on when we talk about deformations. Um, and, and I would say this is kind of the foundation of the subject, this is why people started to, to study it. Uh, this is not what we're going to discuss today. What we're going to discuss today is entirely algebraic, but this is kind of where the subject would come from. Okay. Oh, yeah. We're going to start with some definitions before we get to what a deformation actually is. But so, uh, I hope everyone here is comfortable with the algebra over a field. Uh, we, we present a slightly looser definition than is usually used. So, an algebra over a field F is going to be an F vector space equipped with a bilinear product. And we know that the bilinearity, suppose that my product is star, if I have A star B plus C, this is going to be equal to A star B plus A star C. It kind of looks like ring multiplication. And this is kind of what we are trying to capture when I say a bilinear product, is that it, it behaves a bit like ring multiplication, and when it's associative, it is ring multiplication. Um, and so when this um, bilinear product is associative, we do have a ring. I don't know what the eraser is. Um, but yeah, so this is, is meant to look like ring multiplication. Um, then, suppose that we have a, a subset S of an algebra. Then we say that S will generate the algebra, if we can write everything, every element of the algebra as k linear combinations of products of things in our set. So, you know, these products can be really big. I mean, of course, they have to be finite, but as long as we can reach every element with these um, products of these elements, then we are this generate. Uh, we'll focus on this later. And then, yeah, we've got some funny notation here. So, C brackets xy with the brackets t. This is going to be a polynomial ring over C where the variables X and Y don't necessarily commute, but T commutes with everything. And this will be important to us later. Okay. Now we get to the formal definition. This definition is quite scary looking, but um, we're not going to kind of dwell on it for too long. But so one parameter formal deformation or deformation of a K algebra A is going to be a formal power series. And to so note it's formal, we're not gonna ask questions about its convergence and we're, you know, we're not gonna worry about that. And most of our examples will be finite in some sense anyway, so it won't be a problem. Um, with coefficients in K module homomorphisms from A10 to A to A, these are just um, bilinear products. We were just were adding on more bilinear products. Um, such that the, the zeroth one, so the one with no T um, component, corresponds to multiplication in A. And what I want you to take from this definition is just that we have produced a new multiplication that has a dependence on this parameter T. How, you know, what that multiplication is, I don't want to worry about. We, just, we have a new multiplication and it's parameterized by T. Um, a deformation like this is going to give rise to a family of algebras. Um, we can suppose that we deformed A We can consider this family that arises by evaluating t at, um, you know, in the non-negative real numbers, 
uh, with the constraint that when we evaluate at zero, we get our algebra A back. That's what this part of the definition is saying. Okay, and then there is actually a, a geometric um, interpretation of what's going on here. So suppose that we have an algebraic curve. Um, I think the one I use in the example is this. Um, so suppose we have this algebraic curve, it's going to be some elliptic curve. Um, then we can consider its coordinate ring. So this is when we take the, the polynomial ring kx, and then we quotient, or kxy, and then we quotient out by the ideal generated by that. Um, you know, then we get a quotient ring. This is something that people will study. Um, now, deformations on these coordinate rings correspond exactly to geometric deformations of the, um, of the curve. So as shown... Yeah, so here we have just the curve that I wrote. Oh, it is the curve. That's good. Um, and then you can see we've, we've added in this t parameter, and when we move t to, say, 2, we get this new curve. And so th this is the nice intuition behind deformations. Um, okay. Then we can also consider kind of less well-behaved examples, and, and what we're about to do will lead us towards why the subject can be quite difficult. Okay, so yeah, we're going to stick to a relatively simple example. So we have the algebra. Um, I suppose K is a field. K is always a field. Um, so we have the polynomials over K, and then we take F zero to be its usual multiplication, and then we define F one as follows. So. And again, this tensor is just telling you that the, the map is bilinear. This is, there's nothing deep about the tensor product showing up there. Um, and we're going to do something a bit strange. We take the product of x to the n and x to the m to be the sum of the exponents times x to the product of the exponents, which is, I would say, objectively a strange thing to do. Um, and we're now going to do some computations to see if it's associative, and we're going to discover that it's not. Um, okay, I'll just probably leave this on the board so that you can see it. Uh, okay, so we're just going to compute. So we first address this product. It's going to be x squared. Sorry. This is the deformation that we're interested in. It's you know obviously an element of that formal power series ring. It just has two non-zero coefficients. Um, so we get x squared plus one plus one, so two x to the one, one times one. And then we, we throw in our, our t parameter. Now we continue. We get x to the 4 plus 2x to the t. And then now we have to do the f1 of both of these things. So we're going to end up with 4x to the 4 times t. Okay, now I'm going to erase this. And then now we're going to pull the 2t out, and then we're going to look at x squared times x, which is going to give us 3x squared. Anyway, this is going to evaluate to something, I think. Yeah, if you collect the terms, you get that expression over there. Um, now, if we reorder the multiplication, we move our brackets, we want to check if associativity works. We get Multiplication, if I can speed this up a little bit. Uh, 
And then you know, again, we carry out this multiplication. So we first do the normal one, um, which gives us x to the 4 plus 3t. Now we do our special multiplication. which is going to evaluate to this expression okay and we can see these two are not the same um, they disagree and therefore our deformation is not associative and it turns out that it is really quite difficult to get an associative deformation um, usually what one would do is you'd have to look at the, the first non-zero um, term with a t in the, in the full expression, you know, in the formal power series, this we'll call the infinitesimal. We then need to check if the infinitesimal is a Hochschild 2 co-boundary and so homological algebra and, and kind of, you know, quite involved theory gets involved. There's a lot of machinery that is needed. And this led me to studying abelian categories and then general homological algebra and then some Hochschild cohomology as well, which is all written up in the, in the dissertation, but not what we're here to discuss. Um, point being, this is not an easy thing to produce these associative deformations. So yeah, what one would do in practice is they would then suppose that their first non-zero term was a Hochschild Tuca boundary, then they would try to add on another term. They would then check if that's associative. They would play this game for a very long time until they either lose or are convinced that they found something associative. Um, and I would say this is why our, our method that we've produced is interesting, is because it is, you know, it involves only elementary mathematics. I think all you need to be able to do is form a quotient ring. Um, and then you can produce some of these associative deformations. Uh, we will require some conditions on our algebras, of course. Okay, yeah. So we're going to consider, um, we only work over C, and this is because the, um, all this work came out of some problems that were given to my supervisor by some algebraic geometers, and you know, their context, the ground field was always C, and so we've you know, only worked with C. Um, so we're going to consider a finite dimensional C algebra, A with a two elements generating set. And it generalizes to larger finite um, generating sets, but the, you know, the, the case that we've done the computations for is just um, So we have our A, and then we fixed our A and B, and they generate as an algebra, this is to say the algebra closure, the smallest algebra that contains these two elements, um, is going to be A. Right, and then we're now going to move into AT, and the, the purpose of this T now serves, this is the polynomial ring in one variable T, um, this t is going to turn out to be our deformation variable um, after you know, quite a few steps. Um, and so yeah, now we define x to be t a and we define y to be t b. Something to notice, as this will come up later, is that if t is 1, and then we ask for the algebra closure of x and y, we are going to get a again, because it generates this is the hypothesis. Next, we're going to calculate um, products of x and y, and then eventually we're going to calculate larger products of x and y. And what we're doing here is we're using the fact that a and b generate. And so if you give me a really large product of x and y, a, a, you know, a, large, a large in terms of its total exponent, um, I'm going to be able to reduce that into smaller products of x and y, and then some scalars and perhaps some large power of t next to it. But the idea here is that we're trying to uncover relations um, between smaller products of x and y, and larger products of x and y, that are going to allow us to present an algebra in a few moments. I will do an example and things will become a bit clearer. I, I do agree this is a bit difficult to kind of take in without an example. Um, and we will proceed similarly to um, as done in the Bergman Diamond Lemma paper. And this is what inspired this kind of component of the, of the method. Um, so then, yes, the goal is to get a finite list of kind of small products of x and y such that if you give me any large product of x and y, I can decompose it into things on my list times, so sums of things on my list times powers of t. Um, Um, and once we've got all of our polynomials, these of course are just are all of our relations. These are going to be given by polynomials in, in this polynomial ring. Um, then we're going to present this algebra 
Um, and now kind of what's happened is that we want X and Y to remember that they came from the algebra A, but we want them to be free enough that we can set T to zero and have them not be killed. So this is kind of what we've done here, is that um, X itself and Y themselves don't become zero when T goes to zero, but the larger products are still gonna be controlled by the value of T. Um, and then yeah, we denote by N sub S the algebra that arises from N when we quotient by the ideal T minus S, this is to say that we evaluate T at S. Okay, yeah, the, the first proposition is that when we evaluate at one, we get A, and this is again um, kind of what I was saying earlier where morally um, X and Y remember that they are A and B, and when we evaluate one, you simply get A and B, and then you get the algebra you sorted with back. Um, the next proposition is that the family that you get from this actually does give you a definition that satisfies the definition from earlier, which is you know, quite non-trivial. You know, how would I recover this multiplication? It's, it's generally not an obvious thing to do. And then finally, this deformation is associative as well. So it's kind of you know, through these elementary methods, we have gotten a, a real um, deformation that, you know, in, in the sense that we wanted, because of course all of our mathematics, we, we usually want things to be associated. Okay, we're now going to go over an example. So, we are going to consider the algebra of 2 by 2 matrices over C, and we are going to produce a, a polynomial algebra that's going to deform into it, and this deformation will be associated. So, we have our would-be generating elements A and B. Um, these computations are machine verified, so I can confidently tell you that A and B do in fact generate A. And in practical terms, you will, in my opinion, benefit a lot from fixing a basis um, before step two, because when you want to get relations on things, you, you, your basis is going to give you information. Um, okay, so now we begin to compute. We find, or no, I suppose we let x equal t a, y equal t b, and now we're going to compute. So both of our matrices, if you check, they square to the identity, so we get x squared is going to be uh, t squared times the identity, which I want to denote as t squared times i. Like the identity is sort of a special element in this whole thing. There will always be a relation on it, but that wasn't necessarily obvious to me. And um, because ring homomorphisms preserve one, we can kind of, if you squared it and you consider the, where we're going to go, this relation has become x squared is equal to t squared, not x, you know, the, the one's going to fall away. Um, next, we're going to calculate x, y. This is going to be equal to t squared. And then now we can represent this in terms of our basis from earlier. So this is going to be t squared um, e2 minus e2 minus e3. Similarly, we calculate this. Um, we now calculate yx. We get t squared. We get this matrix. And then we represent in terms of our basis again and we get E3 minus E2. So you can see now we've learned something. We have these, these elements anti-commute, and this is gonna be really helpful to us because it's kind of the next best thing as opposed to commutativity. Finally, we compute Y squared, and we get, again, that the identity matrix. And so now again, we've learned you know, quite a few things. We've learned that the square of X and the square of Y agree, and we've learned that both of them are the t squared times the identity, and so if the t is zero, y squared and x squared are both gonna vanish. Um, okay, and summarize these here. So these are the things we've learned. We've learned that this is gonna be zero in, our, um, in the ring that we present. This is gonna be zero. And, and now we can use these relations to drive um, further information. So, now we haven't got quite enough to reduce any product of x and y into um, one of a finite list, so we continue. We look at x, y squared, 
we look at x cubed. Uh, since x squared is going to be t squared times the identity, this is simply going to be uh, t squared times x. Similarly for y cubed, um, this is going to be t squared times y, because y also is an involution. Um, okay. Now uh, we need to also consider kind of mixed products of x and y in the degree 3 case. So let's say we start with y squared x. y squared is x squared, so we can make this x cubed. Then we can also um, switch the order. We now know that these two agree as well because we can make the, the right two x's into two y's instead of the left ones. And then we go back to x cubed and then we get to squared x. So now we can we can handle products like this. And then of course if y was if the x was in the middle, we could anti-commute and then do the same thing. So we also understand that case. Similarly, if we look at x squared y. This we can make into y cubed and then into y x squared, y cubed again, and then t squared y. And again, if, if the y was in the middle, we could anti commute and then we would be able to, you know, again reduce it, which obtains we have these two relations which allowed us to get these relations. And it turns out that now we do have enough information to present an algebra and we will be able to you know, know what all of the larger products are. And so we do just that. We present this, this N as this kind of relatively free object quotient out by the ideal generated by our, our six generators from the previous slide. And then we can now substitute in values for T. So we substitute in a zero and we get this algebra, which didn't tell me too many things, but we have this. And then if we substitute one in, we get this new algebra, and we know that there is an associative deformation starting at N0 that goes through to N1. And we also know that, although it doesn't look it, N1 is isomorphic to two by two matrices over C. And furthermore, in the proof, it tells us that the um, the isomorphism is given by this, this function signature. You tell it where the generators go and then you have everything. Um, and then there is something to be said. So the problem that we were given is we had, you know, we had algebra A, algebra B, um, find, an alge find a deformation from A to B. And so you know, the, the way that we approach this problem was by starting at the end and trying to go back. And then this is of course quite tough because choosing the, the generators tells you where you know, you, you have to know what generators you want to get the algebra you have. This can be quite difficult. Uh, I suppose some advice, as this example indicates, is if you want something that anti-commutes, then you should choose two generators that anti-commute. Uh, I would imagine this is how you would be able to develop the, um, the conditions. Um, yeah. And... Oh yes, now I have some, some questions that I think could extend this, this method a bit. So I think the first one is, is kind of, suppose we have two distinct generating sets. Um, how would one determine when they give you the same N0? Uh, I think this would be an interesting thing to know. I think another question is, yeah, is, um, you know, suppose that you've been studying A for quite some time and you know some of the ring theoretic properties of A, what does that, does that tell you anything about the N0 that you get? If so, what does it tell you? Um, furthermore, in the same spirit, uh, if your two generators satisfy an interesting ring theoretic properties so item potency or prime or whatever, would this also tell you something about the N0? I think these would be all interesting questions to know the answer to. Um, and yeah, this is all I have. Thank you for your attention. Um, Questions? Thank you. Yes. Any questions from the audience? Yeah, Joe. Um, so at the beginning you were talking about um, being interested in like, very small perturbations. Yeah. So uh, maybe could you talk a bit about, like in your example, in the matrices example? Yeah. What, what would really small perturbations of T look like? Is that kind of 
I suppose no. In, in that sense, what I've done is misleading because we. Um, this was a kind of a philosophical motivation for the study, but this is not um, how we've kind of looked okay. at things. It's not uh, no, no. Because I mean, yeah, I want the whole one to get back to my matrices, so I'm not. I'm not doing small perturbations. I am doing the, the whole thing. Yeah, Edward. When you said <clears throat> that you uh, that those questions are just interesting to others, like totally unsolved or is there like some some sort of work being I mean, done to them given that the method hasn't been published yet this is unpublished work i i would think yes they're purely unsolved in the sense that we haven't solved them and no one else knows what this is yeah i would say they're entirely unsolved mm -hmm. uh, we, we've been thinking about them but no we don't have any solutions more questions Could you go back to your first uh, two examples? Yes, the, um, yes. Oh, the, the, the geometric one. Yeah, first you have the, the elliptic curve, uh -huh. which is not only an um, associative deformation, but it's actually commutative. Yes. And then your second example sort of you know, is not associative. Oh, you mean the, this second is not? Yeah, that one. Yeah. Before you, you, you get in. Um, what about commutativity in your uh, in, the, in your theory? So is that somewhere that you can see if you start from something commutative, will you regain? Will you gain that, or is there any criteria so for that? I think the the reason that these sorts of methods are used, kind of in this context, is um, some time ago I think physicists realized that commutativity is is too strong of something to ask for, and in general, real systems are are controlled by non-commutative algebras. And so this was used to start with a commutative algebra and then provide you with a, with a Poisson algebra that is not going to be commutative. So, but it, in general, nothing that you care about is going to be preserved. Uh, these are very kind of fickle objects. You, you won't generally preserve commutativity, associativity, dimension, kind of a, anything that you want probably won't be preserved unless and, you know that. And then in your methods, what about your methods? Um, mm -hmm. What about commutative? There. No, I don't think it'll be preserved. I, there's no reason for it to be. Uh -huh. um, something that is actually preserved in the method that I didn't speak about is dimension. So this is another thing that is cared about in the subject yes. is, is your deformation flat? Does it preserve dimension? Uh -huh. And it, it turns, ours does. The, the, the method does give you flat deformations as well. But it was really tough. Like at the beginning, I was wanting to find you know, the invariance of, of elements of the families, and nothing that you find, nothing that you would want, is necessarily still there. Um, yeah. Do you kind of uh, motivate where the spatial of the method comes in? Uh, no, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> No, there were pro it was problems like this where you have like an algebra on the one side, an algebra on the other side. How can we produce a deformation across? Um, I think I spent a lot of time looking at examples and was able to produce something. What, was there any, any sort of circumstantial evidence when you looked at the two algebras that made you think, well, so, so this, likely this was this was what was given to us. Is um, okay. uh, an algebraic geometer he had reason to believe that there was a deformation between these two things. He couldn't find it, and he wanted us to try to find it. Okay. Any other questions? If not, let's end. Okay. The end. Thank you. So we'll resume with the last.